Bridget, Bridget Nels. Hi there, Robert. Good evening, colleagues, and welcome to this webinar. We are just about halfway filled. We are just um, holding for any last minute participants who perhaps just getting off of work. So if you would just bear with us for a minute and see uh, if we get a few more coming in. We were expecting close to 100. We're about halfway there. So if you please uh, excuse a slight delay, let's see if we can get the other half in in the next minute or so. Thank you. Okay, so good evening, dear colleagues. Uh, let's take a start and hopefully others will come in uh, shortly. We are at 47 participants now and bearing in mind that, you know, for some people it's a long day, let's not punish those who came on time by having them wait. So um, thanks very much for, for signing in and, and joining us today for this first Integral Human Development uh, Commission of the AEC webinar. We are live streaming this event and we are also recording it. Um, my name is Lawrence Latchman Singh. Mm -hmm. I'm from the Diocese of Georgetown. And before we go any further, I'd like us to take a moment and begin this session in the right way. I'll ask Archbishop Pinder to lead us in an opening prayer. Archbishop. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brothers and sisters, let us hear once again some words of Jesus from the Gospel of Luke. Raising his eyes toward his disciples, Jesus said, Blessed are you who are poor, for the kingdom of God is yours. Blessed are you who are hungry, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who are now weeping, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude and insult you and denounce your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice and leap for joy on that day, because your reward will be great in heaven, for their ancestors treated the prophets in the same way. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. But woe to you who are filled now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will grieve and weep. And woe to you when all speak well of you, for their ancestors treated the false prophets in the same way. 
Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we ask that you deepen within us a sincere desire to appreciate all the many ways in which you bless us. And as we journey together in faith now, by this marvel of digital communication, we ask that you keep us mindful of our baptismal vocation. Guided by your word, may we have minds and hearts open to hearing your word. Grant us the spirit of discernment to understand your word and grant us the courage to follow where you lead us. We ask these things through Jesus Christ, your son, who lives and reigns with you in the union with the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks very much, Archbishop. Much appreciated. So, colleagues, to get us started, I will I will be your moderator today. We we have about an hour and a half, maybe a little bit more. Um, but let's let's try to shoot for ninety minutes uh, for this webinar. We're very very happy with the response rate that we got for this for this webinar. We we uh, put on the screen. Oh, almost 100 people um, took the time to register for this um, event. And we, we found some of the, the uh, demographics quite interesting. So for your benefit, um, just so you know, there were 89 persons who did register, plus the commissioners. There are about eight of us. And it's about two to one in terms of male, female, or rather female to male, as you see on your screen. and. Perhaps that's that's also something to be grateful for. We are getting a lot of um, female participation in something that's still in a relatively new area of work, integral human development. In terms of ages, here's who the, the profile of folks who registered to join this webinar today. And 36% are 60 and above. But you see there's a bit of a spread um, throughout um, the different age ranges. Uh, not so many on the younger side, but that perhaps is its own message uh, in terms of one of the challenges or opportunities for doing this kind of work. So we have a nice age spread as well. And then we do have, a, I think, a, a, a very impressive spread across the region. Uh, you see on the screen here, um, apart from two areas, um, there is representation from every other diocese and archdiocese of, of our region. This is incredibly heartening, and um, I think we at the Commission would, would certainly um, feel a, a great deal of support when we look at numbers like this to see where is the interest coming from. Yes, Port of Spain has 33, but there are, there's a spread throughout um, Paramaribo, um, Nassau, uh, St. George's, uh, even, even Mandeville is here. Um, so, so we've got a really good spread. So, that's really just to give you a quick snapshot of, of who is in the space. We're now up to 52 participants. Um, and we'd firstly like to definitely thank everyone who showed up and uh, is going to spend some time with us today. I'd like now to just say a quick word on our agenda, just so that everyone is able to follow as to how we're moving along. I, I've just put into the chat um, the kind of flow that we, we hope for today. Uh, we're at item number two. If you, if you look into your chat, the chat box, we're at the welcome and overview. And very shortly, we'll be moving into uh, three substantive sessions. One, an introduction to integral human development and the commission, a session uh, with Mike, uh, Mike alone today, um, but it was Mike and his wife originally uh, working on biblical and synodal perspectives. And then a second session with Father Matthew Ragavir on the formation of the human conscience. And then we want to move to an open discussion. The idea here is that we want to have a lot of participation. Yes, we're going to be doing some sharing. There will be some people speaking and giving information and knowledge and that kind of thing. But we would like to aim for maximum participation. I will be giving more information about how participants can actively participate along the way as we evolve. As I mentioned before, the event is being live streamed and recorded also. And the idea here is that the content created uh, in, the, in this webinar is going to be shared, distilled, packaged, 
put into media form, video form, thanks to those uh, who are working with us at the AEC Secretariat. And we, we have to say a special thank you to them. So colleagues, uh, participants, we are now up to 52. I hope the others might come in shortly. But without any further ado, let me introduce and ask to take the floor um, Bishop Allen, the, the Bishop of Georgetown and the Chair of the Integral Human Development Commission of the AEC. Um, Bishop Allen is going to give us about 10 minutes of content um, to, to sort of situate us in terms of this Integral Human Development Commission. So, Bishop Allen, all yours. Thank you, Lawrence, and uh, greetings all. Thank you for joining us on this webinar this evening. Before we go into the main presentations, I would first like to introduce to you the members of the commission and then say a few words about integral human development, a few words about the commission. At present, the members of the commission are, so myself, Bishop Francis Aline, and as chair, um, Archbishop Patrick Pinder, from the Archdiocese of Nassau, Bishop Carol Chuni from the Diocese of Paramaribo, Miss Leela Ramdeen, Archdiocese of Port of Spain, uh, Miss Marcia Harewood from the Archdiocese of Castries, Mrs. Yuli Elliott, Archdiocese of Nassau, Mr. Lawrence Batchman Singh, Georgetown, and Miss Markel Mangra, also Arch, uh, the Diocese of Georgetown, serving as secretary. As we go forward, we hope to have representation of all the provinces in the Antilles and also hope to co-opt persons with particular knowledge and skills pertaining to the work of the Commission. Pope Francis in 2017 formed a new dicastery for the integral human development. It was the amalgamation of four pontifical councils. It was bringing together what Pope Francis called the competences of these four councils. The councils were the Council for Justice and Peace, the Pontifical Council Cor Unum, the Pontifical Council for the Pastoral Care of Migrants and Itinerant People, and the Pontifical Council for healthcare workers. These would be brought together in the new dicastery of integral human development. In formally setting up and naming the dicastery for integral human development, Pope Francis said, and we see on screen there, in all her being and actions, the church is called to promote the integral development of the human person in the light of the gospel. This development takes place by attending to the inestimable goods, justice, peace, and the care of creation. Slide. This dicastery will be competent, particularly in issues regarding migrants, those in need, the sick, the excluded and marginalized, the imprisoned and the unemployed, as well as victims of armed conflict, natural disasters, and all forms of slavery and torture. The concept of integral human development in the first place is gospel teaching. The Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 10, you know, I have come so that they may have life and have it to the full. Some of the gospel teachings are corrected. You know, one of my favorite uh, passages is when the disciples, uh, under the influence of the ways of the world, uh, began, you know, argued about being the greatest. Uh, Jesus emphatically says to them, this must not happen to you. No, if you want to be great, be servant. The gospel teaching is, exhort is exhortative. I think of Matthew chapter five. You know, you'll learn how it was said to our ancestors, you know, eye for eye, love neighbor and hate enemy. But I say to you, 
love your enemies, go the extra mile, forgive, exhortation, inviting conversion, development, growth. The gospel affirms human dignity. Matthew chapter six, you know, if God takes care of every detail of creation, how much more is that stamp of worth and the image of God in the human person? In due course, the, the commission will put some more resource material and on the AEC website as, as those uh, that we um, sort of keep in touch with, we can point you to that. So integral human development is about the protection, the formation and development of the whole person and the whole of humanity. At the beginning of its mandate, the AEC Commission for Integral Human Development set out to formulate its mission, core business, and key areas of responsibility. So as we saw in the previous slide, the mission is to inculcate integral human development as a way of living the gospel in our region. Our core business, next slide to promote, celebrate, and defend the sacredness of human life in its entirety. And, uh, and to just look at the areas of responsibility that we have listed for ourselves, to proclaim the social teaching of the church through publications, conferences, etc., to collaborate with organizations and associations dedicated to the promotion of justice and peace to, to whatever extent possible, to raise the awareness and initiate public conversations around the pressing issues, social issues of the region, to consider and promote a culture of disaster preparedness and resilience across the region. Slide. To continue or to consider and promote a culture of, or to study develop and promote the concept of the integrity of creation and stewardship with special attention to Laudato Si and Querida Amazonia, to point the faithful to the spiritual and material needs of migrants, seafarers, sailors, fishermen, airline employees and passengers, tourists, refugees, asylum seekers, returnees and displaced persons to study the impact of tourism on the socio-cultural life of the region and promote healthy lifestyles and holistic development among God's people. <laughs> this is a tall order. What is stated in that list is huge, even overwhelming. On one hand, it calls on the church to name and lament the elements in our region that threaten the integrity and well being of our people. On the other hand, it falls to us all to describe and celebrate the gifts, what is unique and special in our region and in our people. In this first of what we hope will be a series of webinars, we will be looking at some biblical and synodical, sorry biblical and synodal perspectives of integral human development. God's word is always a primary source. And in recent months, when all the dioceses of the region have been reflecting on synodality, we have been speaking about our journey together, about some of our afflictions and concerns, but also our hopes and dreams. Mike James will lead us in this reflection. Also, the commission felt that in carrying out its mandate, it would like to help build the capacity in each person through their faith to become more aware of the moral landscape of the region and assume responsibility for it. You know, in, in our well-known hymn, you know, we utter the words, God's spirit is in my heart and this called me, set me apart. You know, this is what I have to do. So with Father Matthew Ragbir, we want to take a look 
of the formation of the human conscience. So let us begin our conversation. I note from the registration that there is a wide representation of dioceses of the region and here with us this evening. The commission needs to hear from you, your perspective, what is happening in your neck of the woods. And we hope to establish and build a network to further the conversation. So thank you everyone. Back to you, Lawrence. Thanks very much, Bishop, and thanks for reminding us and repeating that, that today's webinar is the first in a series that the Commission wishes to hold with folks from around the region, um, partly to introduce the concepts of integral human development, but importantly also, as Bishop has said, to hear from persons across the region about what's happening locally. What are the opportunities for us to be more involved as church? And of course, the two points uh, about the two sessions that we're about to start, the link to scripture and synodality, as well as the challenge of building the capacity in each person to live the gospel in the fullest possible way, uh, including in the difficult and uncomfortable world of, as Bishop was outlining there, migrants and social effects of tourism, um, violence, injustice, and so on. So without any further ado, let me um, quickly introduce uh, Mike. Well, it was supposed to be Mike and his wife, Maria James, but uh, Mike indicated earlier that Maria is not feeling so well. So Mike will be uh, a bachelor for this next session on biblical and synodal perspectives on integral human development. Mike himself, for those who don't know him, he's well known in the region, but he is Guyanese while Maria is Mexican. They're based in Mexico and they have two lovely children who have flown the nest. Mike became a permanent deacon about 20 years ago. He's a former Jesuit trained in philosophy, theology, social anthropology, and mathematics. He has served in his time with the UN, the Caribbean Council of Churches, the AEC itself, and the Catholic Biblical Federation, to name a few. I know she's not here, but in fairness, Maria has contributed to the PowerPoint presentation and the content that we're about to enjoy. And so a few words on Maria, I think is quite warranted. She's a social scientist with uh, interest and experience in the areas of human rights, peace, the environment and development. She has served as a teacher and as a translator and an interpreter, which fills with, uh, that fits very well with her own scholarship in scripture. Uh, she's, she's Mike's able partner. And Mike, uh, on that note, I'll ask you to load up your PowerPoint presentation, please. While I um, mention to participants that the next little while of, of Mike's presentation, we want to begin starting the interaction. We're not opening microphones as yet. But what I would invite participants to do during the during the course of Mike's um, presentation, please, if you have any questions or comments or thoughts as you, as you listen to the presentation unfold, please use the chat function. Those of you who are familiar with Zoom will know there's a button down at the bottom of your screen that says chat. You just click on that and type into the chat box whatever you feel you know, you're being called to share. And as we move along Mike's presentation, he and I will examine what's coming up in that chat and try to integrate that into the presentation, which will run for about 20 minutes or so. Um, I hope that's quite clear and that participants will take advantage of the opportunity that Zoom affords for more of us to have a voice in the conversation. So Mike, without any further delay on my part, um, over to you and uh, your presentation. Okay. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lawrence, and, and wonderful to, to see, you know, all, all, all the different faces and so many memories from, from across the Caribbean. Um, uh, I guess uh, Lawrence will, will give me the okay to, to, share, to share my screen. Yes, you can go ahead. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay. Um, yes. Um, yes. Um, Maria just uh, extends her apologies for, for not being able to be with us. She's not feeling so well, but she and I, as Lawrence has mentioned, worked together very much on, on the presentation and on the, the background, because um, very interestingly that um, when we were working with the AEC from 2007 to 2014, um, uh, there was a meeting of the of the Salam in, in Colombia uh, on the Bible in the role of the work uh, of the church and the mission of the church. And in fact, we had uh, a number of other meetings of the bishops at the same time. So um, Archbishop Pinder, who was at the time the, the president of the AEC, says, okay, well, since none of the bishops can make it, um, um, let's, let's send Maria. She's a, she's a volunteer, she speaks Spanish. And she can go to the meeting of the the, the bishops in 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 Latin America and uh, report on the work of the the Bible in in the new resurgence of the Word of God in the in the activity of the church. So Maria went, and um, uh, okay, you'll see a little bit more of what the outcome of that was because she made a presentation to the bishops, and then the bishops got very, of the AC got very involved in ABP, the Biblical Animation of All Pastoral Life. But that's a little bit more about that as we go on. So here we've um, prepared a, a, a PowerPoint presentation with just a few highlights um, of the biblical and synodal perspectives um, for human, integral human development. So what is human integral human development? Well, okay, Bishop Francis has given us um, an, an, an outline of that. And as he, as he mentioned, um, uh, Pope Francis initiated, initiated this new kind of super, super ministry in the church uh, called integral human development that brought together all the major activities of social service of the church. Um, that he mentioned, the four different key areas. Um, some of you will be familiar with justice and peace commissions. Uh, you, you don't hear so much of that directly because justice and peace, peace, peace has now been subsumed into integral human development. So we'll have commissions on, of, in the dioceses now with a focus on integral human development. And all, uh, all of these different areas of the church's work are directly on the Pope Francis's um, leadership. So he's very concerned about this aspect of, of the, works, the work of the church, which you've seen in, in all his actions and his words. And um, one of the things that Pope Francis keeps um, emphasizing is the need for us to reduce the dramatic inequality between those who have too much and those who have nothing, because that's central to the gospel. And it was so beautiful that um, Archbishop Pinder, um, I suppose mo most people know why Archbishop Pinder gave us that reading that he gave us today. Um, well, in fact, it's, 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 it's the reading for the, the gospel, the daily gospel for today. And it comes from, of course, from um, St. Luke at that beginning of the, 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 sermon, the sermon on the plain. Okay, My, Matthew makes his, the sermon on the mount. Um, Luke gives it um, from the, the sermon on the plain. Um, more or less the same thing, except that Luke is speaking directly to the poor. Blessed are you poor. Matthew says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Hmm? He's, he's speaking to a wider audience. Luke is speaking to those poor who are gathered and emphasizing the importance of our humility, of our recognition, of our solidarity with the poor. And it's the poor who are really the ones who are inheriting the kingdom of God. It's a contradiction to the values of the world. So as Pope Francis said in his introduction to, to this work, only the path of in integration between peoples can permit human humanity a future of peace and home. 
only in so far that we remove inequality, the things that make people so unhappy and suffering, will we can will we really get peace in the world. So um, Pope Francis emphasizes then that integral human development means the integration of all aspects of human activity, economy, finance, labor, culture, family life, religion, politics. Eh? So often we, we still hear in some circles, you know, the church should keep out of politics. But you no, know, what is politics? Politics re refers to polis, the Greek for, for the population, for the people, eh? and our church and our God is involved in us as humans, hmm? very much in, in involved in that. So uh, Pope Francis underlines that we need to take into account that human life, again, not confrontational, but in a symphony, a very interesting symbol that, that Pope Francis uses. He says that our work should be like, like that of an orchestra that sounds good only if the different instruments are in accord and follow a score shared by all. So whether we're laity, whether we're clergy, whether we're um, uh, men, women, uh, children are all involved in sharing the work of the Lord in every different aspect of human development. Um, Francis um, himself um, is very involved in the need for economic and political change. Francis criticizes this, uh, this uh, ideology, which was at one time very popular in the 80s, 90s, uh, 2000, of uh, it was called neoliberalism. Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan said, look, the important thing was to help the rich. When the rich get richer, they will share their wealth to the poor. And Pro Francis says, no, but what happens when the rich get richer? What happens to the glass, you know, that is, as it gets fuller and fuller? Um, the, the ideology of capitalism and neoliberalism said that once the glass was full, it would overflow and the poor would benefit. It's called the trickle down theory. But the Francis says, but what happened when the gas gets full? it magically gets bigger and nothing ever comes out for the poor. And uh, as we see, even in, the, in, in COVID, the, the dreadful um, uh, pandemic that has been affecting the world, yes, the poor have gotten poorer, but the rich, all the people from Amazon down and Microsoft have, have become doubly rich, triply rich in the world because of the sufferings of us all. So Mike, if I could just intervene quickly. Yeah. Um, Natasha Huston has actually raised an interesting question. I think you're just about touching on it there. Whether when you say inequality, are you referring only to material possessions? And I think mm -hmm. your point just now about inequality of access, for example, to health care or, or those kinds of other inequalities. Would you care to say a, a couple extra words on, on sort of broadening um, the meaning of inequality, certainly from the perspective of integral human development. Right. Um, yes, and in fact, it, uh, what then uh, Natasha is, is, is asking and commenting fits in ex, ex precisely with the, the last comment of Pope Francis here. He says, a good economic policy creates jobs. It doesn't eliminate them. You know, so we can, we can have a, a, a theory of development that says, look, the, be the better the system, the less people we employ, the more profits we make. And Francis says, uh-uh, no, no. True development means that jobs, access to culture, access to education, access to health should be available to everybody. That is, that's our goal, not for, for just some people to have, or even for us just to have um, uh, economic terms. Um, like, and the reading from today, um, from St. Saint, Saint Luke, okay, he talks about the poor, but then he also talks about those who are, who are sad, hmm? um, who are sad now, eh? who are in their personal lives, they're not happy. Hmm? And those are the ones to whom Jesus is reaching out, especially. Eh? So it's not only um, material things, but our, our, our social, 
our psychological equality and our ability and our need to reach out to those who are suffering loneliness, the old, the aged. Pope Francis is very, very strong on that. So it's, it's an integral human development in the wider sense that, um, that uh, culture and development is more, much more than simply economic development. And, um, and of course, Francis, uh, Pope Francis speaks out very strongly on issues like, for example, the, the values of the world uh, that tell us to seek for power and money, whereas God is telling us to seek humility, service, and love. And that is what will really make us happy. Mm -hmm. And then he's just echoing the words of Jesus. So, <clears throat> so we can ask ourselves, um, who is the example of the most human, most fully integrated human person? Who can we think of? If you wanted to, to, to an example or a model of who is our, uh, of the most integrated human being. And sometimes we might not think of, of him because we, um, we think of, um, of, and maybe people can just put a, a note, no? Who, who would be your example of the of the most fully human integrated human person, fully human integrated? And um, Pope Francis reminds us that that person is in fact um, Jesus. Hmm? God Himself made Himself fully known in Jesus Christ. Right. So, in all these acts of God and Christ, in acts of healing, of liberation, reconciliation. He showed the depth of his humanity. And that humanness lived out in his fullness is what showed how close he was to God. Um, sometimes we, 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 we tend to think of ourselves that the closer we get to, to, to God, the less human we are. We become divine. No. Jesus, this is why Jesus became human. And for us to become more like God, we need to become more human. So how, but how do we get to know and follow Jesus? And here's where the whole aspect of the, the word of God um, comes into focus, in a focus that perhaps hasn't been as strong as it has, should be in the church. And um, back in 1965, at the end of the Vatican Council, the bishops, um, after working very hard on this document, it saw two or three different revisions until finally it was, it was approved on the role of the word of God in the life of the church. And one of the key statements from that document, um, uh, uh, the verbum, was this. Ignorance of scripture, the bishop said. I think we've gotten um, stuck um, for a moment here. Um, would it be possible, um, uh, Lawrence or, or, or Lauren to, to share your screen because my, my, um, my screen has stopped sharing. Let me, let me see if I can get doing one more thing. Okay.
Yes, Mike? We see this screen. Yeah, I think I, um, my screen. You should go ahead from there in case another, in case something happens. Yeah, okay, good. Okay, um, so anyway, the, the bishops uh, um, in at, at the Vatican Council said, this, this sacred synod forcefully and specifically exhorts all the Christian faithful to learn the surpassing knowledge of Jesus Christ by frequent reading of the divine scriptures for, and this is the key phrase, ignorance of scripture is ignorance of Christ, which are very, very strong words indeed, that if we don't encounter Christ in the gospels, we cannot say that we know him. And this is so clear, so obvious, um, but it's, it doesn't come just from, from, from um, the Vatican Council. It's in fact a quotation from, from um, Pope um, St. Jerome, who in the, the fourth century was the first person to, to do a translation from the Greek um, gospels, because again, the, the gospels are, are and the, the whole of the Bible written between Hebrew and Greek, was the first to translate the entire, the entire Bible into the lingua franca of that day, Latin. And he spent his entire life making it more available to the people of his day. And of course, now we have translations in, in all the languages of the world. And he insisted that ignorance of scripture is ignorance of Christ. And all the, the documents and the synods of the church have uh, underlined that um, in, in recent years. Um, now the Bible is by, by far the most popular book in the Bible, right? So people take it seriously. Yet it's also undeniable that among the 75% majority of Protestants, Evangelicals and Pentecostals, familiarity with the Bible is much more common among them than among us. Um, everybody, I think uh, our, uh, our, our bishops in, um, in Jamaica, um, one of our bishops said, you know, anytime I start a quotation with my people, they, they, all, can, uh, they, they all can answer it, they can complete the, the quotation um, because so many of them come to the Catholic church on a Sunday morning and on Saturday afternoon, they're attending a, a Pentecostal uh, meeting at which, at which there's perhaps a lot more familiarity with the gospel texts. Um, so it's a, it's a question that perhaps we can ask ourselves, why is it if the word of God is so important to us, why is it we have kind of given it over a little bit to the Protestants? Um, now, Pope, Fre Pope, Pope Benedict, mm -hmm. Are, are you in fact seeing the 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 current um yeah mike slide? we're seeing the you current are... slide yeah oh, yeah, we're, we're, yeah. Okay. Uh, mike as i'm on the floor if we could um uh, sorry to mention this but we are mm. running tight on time okay good so i speed up a little bit um so yes um uh benedict's the the 16th uh, at um at uh, a big meeting of the of the bishops of Latin America and the Caribbean also emphasize the importance of training people to read and meditate on the word of God so that this may become their staple diet. And if they don't know the message of the word of God, how can they share it? So um, the AEC itself took this very seriously. And there's a, just a brief outline there of, of the history of the Bible in the, in, in the AEC. And in 2013, the bishops themselves got um, committed to making the word of God a priority for the new evangelization in our region. And here we just have a couple more um, images that Francis has used in the year of, the, of mercy. He used a number of these images to convey the importance of us encountering with Christ as merciful as the most are a very striking image of the 
of the image of Christ. What, what is Christ for us and what should we be for others? Um, Pope Francis says, mercy is the name of our God and without mercy, we are lost. And finally, just uh, one additional um, image here. This is a famous um, uh, image of a, of a portrait by Rembrandt of the, the, the prodigal son returning yeah? and the father receiving, receiving him. Maria likes to emphasize that a number of um, uh, observers of this beautiful film picture have noted that the, the left hand is, is, is much smaller than the right hand. It looks like a, a sort of two hands, you no, know, a hand of a, a woman and the hand of a man. It's uh, that prodigal father is both male and female. Uh, God, 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 there's some aspects of God that are of mercy are so much like a, like a mother. And finally, perhaps just a word on synodality itself is that synodality for Pope Francis means listening, communicating, participating, and mission together. And we'd like to, to think perhaps that these webinars can be a way in which we in the church can share, listen to each other, um, and benefit from the work of the spirit in each of us. So I'll stop there. Over to you, Lauren. Thanks very much, Mike. And um, thanks also to the colleagues who put thoughts into the chat. There were a couple of items that did come up in the chat, which I'm going to ask that we hold on to those for the open discussion. A very interesting question from the Archdiocese of Kingston, Anna Perkins, asking about the distinction between politics and partisan politics. This has been uh, sort of one of the big issues for the church over the years um, with liberation theology and all of that. And then uh, uh, Deacon David Popo from the Archdiocese of Castries asking the larger question about strategic partnerships within the development realm and whether the commission was moving or planning to move in that direction of larger partnerships. So I'm going to ask those two questions to so just hang on a bit because I think that's really good content for us to kickstart our open discussion after we hear from Father Matthew Ragbeer. Um, I, I did re recognize late in the day that all of our presenters, resource persons, their names started with M. So we had like a three M thing going on, Mike, Maria, and Matthew. So um, we, we want to spend a bit of time now hearing from Father Matthew Ragbeer on formation of the human conscience. And, and Mike got us started in that direction by speaking about becoming fully human. And what does that mean? And how do we achieve that fullness of humanity the way Jesus uh, showed us to? Father Ragbeer is a brother of the Living Water community in Trinidad, and he's also the parish priest of St. Francis of Assisi, appropriately, church in Sagre Grande in Trinidad. He has a BA in theology from UE, as well as a licentiate in sacred theology, which he earned in Rome. He lectures part-time at the regional seminary in Trinidad and also works with the Archdiocesan Family Life Commission. He's a man who enjoys music and the outdoors, as indeed I think you need to if you work on integral human development. Um, I'm going to ask Father Ragby to, to do his presentation. What we've discussed is that his presentation will actually be a straight presentation for about 20 minutes or so. And again, if you've got comments and so on, toss it in and we'll take another five minutes or so at after the 20 minutes of presentation to see if there's any responses that are, can be generated uh, in the context of this session on the formation of human conscience. And after that, we'll then move into an open discussion with remaining questions. We can have a back and forth and see what other thoughts and movements of the spirit have taken place in your, in your own reflections as we go through the webinar. Father, Father Matthew, I'll ask you now to take the floor and um, lead us through this next session. Thank you very much. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be here. I, I felt very torn doing this for a number of reasons because there are competing ways of approaching conscience popularly in the church right now, um, as well as competing anthropologies. And, and there's much that we have to, as it were, pin down to build out an understanding of how do we 
speak about the formation of conscience. So this is simply put in some broad strokes. Uh, much more needs to be built out. And, and hopefully the process itself is formative. Pope Francis tells us, I'm just going to share a screen. Um, can you see that? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Yep. Okay. Um, okay. Pope Francis tells us that we also find it hard. Just a second. I have a problem here with my... We also find it hard to make room for the consciences of the faithful who very often respond as best they can to the gospel amid their limitations and are capable of carrying out their own discernment in complex situations. We have been called to form consciences, not replace them. So it's, it's something that is very topical, but you know, with the more statistics, there's been a lot of conversation around the conscience, formation of conscience. What do we mean by it? Who is a human person, as rightly asked just now? And naturally, every effort should be made to encourage the development of an enlightened conscience, formed and guided by the responsible. And sorry, I'm getting a problem on my computer. Yeah, serious discernment of one's pastor and to encourage an ever greater trust in God's grace. Okay. Yet conscience can do more than encourage and recognize that a given situation does not correspond objectively to the overall demands of the gospel. It can also recognize with sincerity and honesty what for now is the most generous response which can be given to God. And come to see with a certain moral security that it is what God himself is asking amid the concrete complexity of one's limits, while yet not fully the objective ideal. In any event, let's recall that this discernment is dynamic. OK, so we, we have this sense that, that Pope Francis gives us about development and a developmental approach to conscience itself, which perhaps can open for us a way to bridge some of the divides in theology itself um, that has happened. Of, of course, as we go on, I will be laying out some of the basics, as I said. Cardinal Ratzinger, then Cardinal Ratzinger, wrote that some of the greatest crimes of our day have been committed and are being committed by appeal to an individual conscience, as though there were no higher norm. And already there we see, is the conscience itself the arbitrator of truth? Is it where it all lies? Or is it really something that is, is there, but there's something beyond that, that is God, the voice of God, as, as we will see. Pope John Paul II spoke about it when conscience itself is darkened. Um, what happens? We, we, we can't distinguish between good and evil. And we are in this kind of climate of moral rel relativism and a, a moral corruption and a, a, a real confusion, confusion that exists. Okay. I want to sketch something around what we're doing because it's in the context of integral human development. And so I thought this very uh, important. Ryan Anderson wrote an essay some years ago, and he said, Let, let's look at an oversimplification of the church history. We have early church debates that, that happen. Um, who is God? The debates around the truths about God, okay? The Trinitarian formulation, Christological debates, etc. Then he says, think of what happens after that. We have the question, well, what is the church? And the challenges to the truths about the church. And in our time today, the real question is, who is a human person? And, and we face challenges to the truths about the man and the woman, the being made in the image and likeness of God, whom the church is tasked with protecting. The church is tasked with protecting. Okay. Now, here, here we have, and I'm using this image to speak about the moral confusion. And, and we can ask ourselves, what are the voices that we are listening to? What is forming us? What is influencing us? Whether or not we, we may be conscious of it or, or not. But what, what is leading us? The scripture, church tradition, teaching, therefore the sacred magisterium, the witness or lack of witness of persons in the church, um, church leanings, left or right, as, as some may say, um, family traditions, cultures in our own society, 
one's own gut feeling, wisdom, community, positive law, meaning the law laid down by governments. You know, what, what is forming us? Because we, we are in this, if we thought of, think of the church as a, as a boat, you know, and, and the waves around us are many, and the, the kind of climate morally we live in affects us. It's in the air we breathe. It's, it's in the, the water that sprays on us as it were. The, the influences that come to us, they come to us from outside the church as well as within the church, okay? One of the things that has caused a lot of confusion over conscience and is a question of well, what is good? You know, Aristotle said, the good is that to which all things aim. Hume you know, said, reason is a slave to the passions and passions are guiding principles for morality. So he removed the sense of any kind of objective good per se, and he spoke about, well, moral approval and disapproval. G. E. Moore spoke about that the good is undefinable, following along with Hume, Bertrand Russell, anything we desire. Stevenson speaks about ethical statements, the given vents to our feelings. And, and the, the point here is that we live in a very emotive culture where what we feel, we classify as good, and, and it becomes a way of, of ethics for us quite often, and we have to be careful of that because an adequate account of good must be intimately connected with our actions. So says the Catholic philosopher McIntyre. That is to explain why something is good is always to provide a reason for acting in one way rather than another. Let's come back to this, what, what is for, informing us and the ways in which we may feel split or, or divided, the, the confusion. Outside the church, there's the confusion around, well, is there objective truth? What is truth? Again, a truth about a good, if, if it's just about feelings. So, um, so, so on one hand, you may say, well, if it feels good, it is good. But also there's a, the, a wide current of, if it's useful for me, so a utilitarian kind of approach, it's good. Outside the church, the highest virtue arguably that people see is absolute freedom, you know, unbridled freedom. This freedom, one, once I can, no matter what I choose, irregardless, so freedom is liable to do whatever I want, um, it, it's, it's what is good for me. Within the church, there, there's, there's been a lot of confusion, a lot of waves up and down, especially after the publication of Humanae Vitae, and, and therefore in the area of sexuality and ethics, and, and where a, a division emerged, somewhere in the root of what we call proportionalism and revisionist situation ethics saying, yes, there may be moral norms, but these are not really binding because it depends on the history, circumstances and tensions or the um, weighing of goods, that the proportion to which, you know, and, and therefore it's also called consequentialism. And this became more and more popular. And there the, are the persons who gravitated towards this. And at the same time, the church's tradition put forward well, no, it's, it's, there's something that does not change, and that's the objective moral norms. If we're speaking about conscience and the formation of conscience, these things matter. You know, these things matter. And that's why I say it's, it's a very, we have to understand all these things to be able to talk about, well, what is conscience? What is the formation of conscience and how we approach it? Okay. So within a, a, that first um, category, Conscience becomes a space where the individual realizes or actualizes themselves by making moral decisions to what values they claim as their own. Okay, that's how one person uh, puts it forward. And so it's, it's not this necessary reference to what the church is saying or, you know, it's, it's how they realize that within their life. Okay, so again, what are the voices forming us? Okay, their decisions. Uh, an example, a senior church figure says this, and this caused a lot of argument among theologians around conscience. Their decisions of conscience represents God's personal guidance for the particularities of their lives. In other words, the voice of conscience, the voice of God, or what Newman called the aboriginal vicar of Christ, could very well affirm the necessity of living at some distance from the church's understanding of the ideal. So what, what do we see here? Well, we see here, in this case, the individual's subjective conscience. Here's God telling him that he's justified in doing that which is inconsistent 
with what is objectively right and avoiding what is objectively wrong. So that's the way one theologian reads it. Now, how, how do we approach this given integral human development and, and Pope Francis's approach of a step-by-step -step leading people towards the fullness of truth and, and the accompaniment that is needed there? How do we approach this? Not just throwing in the towel and saying, well, conversion doesn't matter. All those are the kinds of questions we have to face and the, the nuances we have to come to terms with as we face the question of the formation of conscience. What Newman actually said was, conscience has rights, and this is from his letter to the Duke of Norfolk, and it's, it's worth reading um, at least once in your life. I read it some years ago. Um, but conscience has rights because it has duties. It is very right. So he's speaking about today, it's um, in his time. It is the very right and freedom of conscience to dispense with conscience. And, and that's what he was seeing, to ignore a law given a judge, to be independent of the unseen obligations that, that are there from God. Conscience is a stern monitor, but in this century it has been superseded by a counterfeit. And what is this con counterfeit um, version of conscience? Well, it's the right to self-will, a conscience that sees itself able to decide whatever. Okay, and, and so again, Newman is showing us, well, that there is a priority to the voice of God in, in guiding us and to truth itself. And again, we can ask ourselves, what is truth? You know, we, we're an integral human development uh, forum. And of course we have to spell out an anthropology. Every ethics has an anthropology and a metaphysics. So who's the human person? What version of reason are we working with? All these sorts of things must be understood if, as we go forward, okay? So what, what was seen in this, and, and it's been seen quite often, is that the law becomes this burden. And the idea that what God is asking of us is beyond us, no real freedom or responsibility. And, and therefore, they speak about a heteronomy, you know, and this heteros, the, the, something that's outside, exterior to us, and, and nomos, the law, a law that is therefore um, exerted upon us. Now, Pope John Paul II answered this in, in various ways, and I'm going to use something here from uh, an essay from Smith that, that pulls it together beautifully. When there's a conflict between the agent's own will and what he or she understands to be the will of God, the, the, um, the dignity of the human person lies not in abiding with his own judgment, but in submitting to God's will, submitting to God's will, okay? And we can see very tart splendor 41 and 49. Um, but submission to God's will does not mean that one is violating one's deeper self. Rather, one is conforming to the deepest truths of one being. Again, it's very important for us to therefore spell it in anthropology. Because if who we are is that, as we read in catechism, and Augustine speaks to us about that this desire for God is written in the human heart, we're made by God and for God was Thomas Aquinas would speak about exitus reditus, that we, we, we come from God and return into God, then God's will is, is the greatest joy of our lives. And, and we have to look at, well, what is the challenge in coming to terms with that in our own lives? You know? And virtue ethics opens a, a space for us to explore that. Some things for us to remember as we make this journey. Accompaniment begins with grace. Okay, so, so much grace is needed in the face of the brokenness that each and every one of us finds ourselves in. That, that's human reality. But it doesn't stop then. This is very important for our reflections on conscience that conversion is at center. And this is from a writer, Granados. And at the end is holiness. Okay, holiness. Accompaniment begins with grace. Conversion is a center. Holiness is a goal. But it does not happen overnight. And sometimes we, we think about it as it just should happen like this. And it's, it's very small steps, as Pope Francis says, uh, towards what God is asking. Okay, I'm just going to, well, yeah. Whatever the case, you know, just, just to help us in, in grounding this a little more, all these situations require constructive response, seeking to transform them into opportunities that can lead, and he's speaking about marriage and family and the brokenness, this is in a more Satitia, um, that can lead to the full reality of marriage and family in conformity with the gospel. 
these couples need to be welcomed and guided patiently and discreetly. And, and again, this is the, the slow part of a compliment. This is how Jesus treated a Samaritan woman. He addressed the desire for true love in order to free her from the darkness in her life and bring her to the full joy of the gospel. So again, it's not leaving her where she was. And, and, and that's what we have to be very careful that we don't slip into that. There is a movement towards conversion and holiness. Now, how long that takes is different for each and every person. Also, Pope Francis reminds us that Jesus looked upon the women and men whom he met with love and tenderness, accompanying their steps in truth, patience, and mercy as he proclaimed the demands of the kingdom of God. I'm just going to leap forward a little bit. Just remember, God is not setting us up. You know, the Council of Trent says he does, he does not command the impossible, but when he commands, he admonishes you to do what you can and to pray for what you cannot do, and he helps you to be able to do it, and that's his grace. So, so we have this confusion and is, and between what we believe, what we live, faith and morality, freedom, conscious truth. And, and this is most experienced in the area of love, sexuality, relationships, marriage, family. What is good? What should I do and what ought we to do as people? Okay. So again, what civilizes us? What forms our consciences and the divisions that we find? What is needed, therefore, is an adequate understanding of who the human person is and we don't have time to go through all of this i mean it would be really great to to go through and name uh, or spell out the uh, uh, something of an adequate anthropology but part of what we have to remember is that we are made on the way we are made on the way we're not made right now and and therefore we are goal directed we are and and we are teleological is a word that is used okay and and that's important for us as we enter into this I'm going to skip this slide. Uh, and therefore, what, what does the church speak of as conscience? If we're talking about the formation of conscience, and the first thing I want to do is uh, name something that quite often people confuse with conscience, which we have been speaking about, which is this kind of emotivism, this feeling of moral approval or disapproval, which, which we all experience in some way, or psychological conditioning. That's not what the church is speaking about when she speaks about conscience, okay? One way some theologians name it is the church is speaking about a particular moral conscience. It's a judgment about the morality of a particular act. Okay. As the catechism says, conscience is a judgment of reason. Therefore, we, we, we can apprehend an order to reality. That's, that's reason, you know, whereby the, the human person recognizes the moral quality of a concrete act that he or she is going to perform in the process of performing or has already completed, or has already completed. The judgment of conscience is a practical judgment, and therefore it applies to a concrete situation, the conviction that one must love and do good and avoid evil. Again, this, this just gives you something from Newman that speaks about the same sort of thing. Then, then, you know, there's these theologians speak about, okay, there's a particular conscience, uh, moral conscience, that's speaking about in this action, in this moment, sorry, in this moment, as I am living, you know, how does this light of conscience refract into this reality, pointing out, okay, this is what is good, this is what is not good. Now, here is a general moral conscience, which speaks about the awareness we have of the most basic truths and principles. Dignitatis humanae. On his or her part, woman or man receives and acknowledges the imperatives of the divine law through the mediation of conscience. The dignity of the human person implies and requires uprightness of moral conscience. Conscience includes the perception of the principles of morality. The application, this is where it gets into the particular moral conscience in a given circumstances by pr uh, practical discernment of reasons and goods. Okay. This is very important for us to, to reflect deeply upon Gaudium Esper 16. In the depths of his conscience or her conscience, woman detects sorry, a law. What happens is the, the mouse disappears once I go into um, the 
sl uh, slideshow again, uh, a law which she or he does not impose upon herself or himself, but which holds the person to obedience. Okay. In the depths of his conscience, we detect something. This is not something we are making up. This is something, this is not something that we are creating. And this holds us to obedience. Hence, the job of the conscience is therefore not this creative sort of making it up. But there's something that we recognize. It always summons us to love good and avoid evil. The voice of conscience, when necessary, speaks to the person's heart. Do this, shun that. For the human person has in their heart a law written by God, and to obey it is the very dignity of the human person. According to it, we will be judged. According to it, we will, we will be judged. Again, so much of this is, is so beautiful. And, and Pope John Paul II, you know, one of the things that's interesting because a lot of his work was to move us to, to bring together the objective kind of abstract realities of, of St. Thomas's influence with a personalism. You know, and, and in fact, in his book, Sources of Renewal, he speaks a lot about consciousness, actually. And, and, and perhaps there's something there in, in, in integral human development and what Pope Francis is saying that can actually bring us a, a new place in understanding conscience. Conscience is the most secret core and sanctuary of the human person. There, she is alone with God, whose voice echoes in her depths. In a wonderful manner, conscience reveal that, reveals that law is fulfilled by love of God and neighbor. In fidelity to conscience, Christians are joined with the rest of men in their search for truth and a genuine solution to the numerous problems which arise in the life of individuals from social relationships. So we are social, you know, the, the way in which uh, John Paul wrote that in a personalistic setting was that we are made for self-gift to each other. That's the social aspect. Hence, the more right conscience will sway, the more persons and groups turn aside from blind choice and strive to be guided by the objective norms of morality. Conscience frequently is. So it's not that it's, it's perfect. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't always see it correctly. From invincible ignorance without losing its dignity. The same cannot be said for a man who cares but little for truth and goodness or for conscience by which degrees grows uh, practically stifled as a result of habitual sin. So it's one thing if somebody really does not know through no fault of their own and invincible ignorance, a different thing if we have not done the work to form our conscience and to grow in truth or because of sin, you know, sin leaves a, 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 a taste within us, you know, do something wrong and a yes, it may repel us, one author says, it may also amuse us, and, and that can grow within us and become a habit within us, okay? Now, there is the obligation that we have to follow our conscience, and, and in all that she says and does, woman is obliged to follow faithfully what she knows to be just and right, and, and, and each of these is saying that, you know, it holds us to obedience, but this does not mean we do whatever we want. Conscience has a judgment of an act is not exempt from the possibility of error. And we, we have to hear that clearly, it's not a license. In order to have a good conscience, the human person must seek the truth and make judgments in accordance with that same truth. Therefore, our moral education is very important. How we do this, how we cultivate the good is very important. How we build responsibility in our children and in each other is, is very important. The formation of moral conscience, therefore we see two aspects that we've seen before, uh, above formation and the general basic principles of morality and the implications in our lives, formation for recognizing the moral quality of a concrete act. So how, how do we do this? Well, it's a heart converted to the Lord and to the love of what is good, which really, which is really the source of true judgments of conscience. Indeed, in order to prove what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect, Knowledge of God's law in general is certainly necessary, but it's not sufficient. What is essential is a sort of connaturality, a word from Thomas Aquinas and very much present in virtue ethics between the human person and the true good. Such connaturality is rooted in and develops through the virtuous attitudes of the individual herself or himself, prudence and the other cardinal virtues, and even before these, the theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity. 
I'm so Father, just to, sorry to sorry to intervene, but we are just about at the twenty five minute mark now. Um, can you give us a quick quick sense of, of when we might wrap up? I don't want to uh, cut too much into the open discussion, so I just want to do a quick time check. Um, give me two minutes. Sorry uh, about that. That's okay. So there's a conversion of heart. Ooh. Um, sorry. Yeah. So, so we can speak about the, the conversion of heart that's needed. You know, faith, hope, and love, the theological virtues, a prayer life, um, scripture and tradition, the sacred magisterium. Again, a study that is needed, but but and and an adequate understanding and, and, and adequate theological and philosophical anthropology. Who am I? What am I made for? Where am I directed to? You know, and um, what, what, what is my life about? You know, how do I attain this? And, and this is a moral education. It's really about an education in, in, in the good. How do I learn to, and, and it's also a pedagogy of our desire. Since everything aims towards what is good, we could also be mistaken in what we think is good. It's not really good for us. And so we have to allow the, the conversion, we have to love the, the cultivation of virtues within us. And that's why community is also important that, you know, and, and as we pray that aspect of faith in the scriptures and our tradition, as we're fed sacramentally, and as we journey with each other, we see examples of virtue before us, ways in which people live with, with good choices. Now, in the cultivation of virtue, what is important there is the recovery of the virtue of prudence in a special way, because conscience is very much part of this. Whilst conscience is a light, it does not empower us to choose. It's the virtue of prudence that you know enters when, when our own dynamisms are open to the power of the spirit and the fruits of the spirit flourish within us. We act prudently. You know, virtue is arete in Greek, it's excellence in action. You know, so so that is important. And lastly, grace, grace, and more grace. You know, at its departure point, the formation of conscience requires being enlightened about God's project of a love for each every single person, the positive and liberating value of the moral law and awareness both of the weakness caused by sin and the means of grace which strengthen us on our path towards the good and uh, towards salvation. Okay, I will stop there. Thanks, thanks, thanks very much, Father. I, I apologize for interrupting earlier. Uh, it's, it's one of the um, least pleasant task of being a moderator, I'm afraid. I, I do apologize. But um, thanks very much for that. And I hope that maybe an idea we didn't think of earlier, but maybe if it's possible to even receive slides from yourself and Mike Marie, and we could circulate it, if that's appropriate, to um, participants who are all registered and we have their email addresses. So a lot of that rich content might actually be here helpful um, after the webinar. Folks can reference all the quotations and, and, and so on. So what I propose we do, um, first of all, it's it's now 20 minutes after seven. We were aiming to finish this in about 90 minutes. We, we got off to a slightly late start. So what I'd like to do firstly is just to um, beg the indulgence of participants to go for an extra 10, 15 minutes. I know folks maybe uh, have had a long day, maybe you haven't had dinner yet, um, but if you could bear with us for this next session on an open discussion, what, what I would propose to do is um, open up the floor to, well, we've had a few questions that are still uh, on the table, uh, but I want to ask in this remaining piece of time that we have, let's say 20 minutes, 25 minutes, that we focus our energies, um, uh, if you will, if you use university terminology, let, let's, if we could major on the future and the creation of needed change and minor on what's either past or present, uh, getting away from the diagnostics, if we could, I, mean, I know we need to understand our context, but if we could try to also help the commission through the proffering of advice, guidance, things that we should concretely consider going forward. Again, it's not, not to, to say either or. We want to look at the future, we want to look at the past, but we don't want to uh, lose this opportunity to get inputs from participants as to where we ought to be going. Um, we know sometimes the glass is half empty, but how do we get it glass, glass half fuller? So we have the chat, it's still available to us. If you want to use it, please do. If you want to speak, you really want to speak, please use the raise hand feature and we'll do our best to have you speak 
um, live on the floor, but we'll ask that if you do uh, get the microphone to speak on the floor, if you could limit your contributions to about a minute, just so that we're fair to everyone else who might wish to contribute. Um, maybe I could uh, kick this session off for, for uh, maybe maybe throw the question. Um, I'll come back to you, Father Matthew, in a second, because there are a couple of questions that did come up um, from uh, Diana in Port of Spain and Anna in Kingston. But Bishop Allen, I, I don't know if I could, uh, you haven't spoken in a while, your vocal cords um, should be fresh. Maybe, maybe I can ask you a question that David Popo had asked earlier about the extent to which the Integral Human Development Commission was thinking about partnering with other development actors since Integral Human Development is, is such a, a broader concern, uh, even outside of our church. Uh, uh, Bishop Allen or anyone from the commission, I don't know if you want to take a stab at that. And then, and then Mike, I'll come back to you with the question about uh, politics versus partisan politics. Bishop Allen or anyone from the commission want to take that question on? Sure. Um, certainly, you know, because even within the church, or very much connected to our church, are the sort of Catholic um, outreach groups, um, um, Caritas, we have Mass here with us on, on Zoom, um, or Catholic Relief Services. Uh, right now here in Georgetown, our migrant outreach is being facilitated by the Pan American Development Foundation and the IOM, the Immigration Organization, um, and uh, whereby they would have the funding, they would also have guidelines, sometimes they have expertise. And uh, we have found very good um, kind of collaboration with them. Um, and uh, and uh, lucky, the team that we have on the ground have been able to give a very good accountability, feedback, and also advise these organizations. Sometimes they are not fully au fait with some of the local dynamics. Um, other areas which um, I found interesting, um, because you know, Guyana situation in number in the 70s, the whole thing of education was taken away from the churches and the government took this on. And, uh, and very recently, more recent times, we've, we've had some collaboration at you know, the church, uh, looking, for example, at um, early childhood learning in indigenous languages. Um, and the, 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 the Ministry of Education, you know, which, yeah, it's interesting, sense of hesitancy, and yet it's something has been happening there. And, um, <clears throat> so so that will be part of my answer to, to them. Um, mm -hmm. David, uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Thanks, David. And I think that's also to acknowledged your larger point that, uh, that these issues have a, a larger stakeholder group that's that's also interested and we should try to maximize our own effectiveness through partnerships so so thanks david for that question mike um, what's your how, how do you respond to the question you know a lot of the faithful say no the church shouldn't be involved in politics um how, how do you kind of articulate the justification for involvement in politics? How do you define politics? And what's the distinction with partisan politics? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, exactly. And I, I think um, Anna, uh, you know, could herself, you know, give us give us some uh, highlights on, on her response. Um, I mean, you have concrete issues, um, you know, for, for many centuries. In fact, the, the Catholic Church uh, was directly involved in politics. You you had the, the papal states. Eh? The, the the pope was the head of the church, but he was also the the see, the the president or of, of the papal states. He was a he was a, a temporal ruler. Again, with its with its challenges and so on. Um, but the, the the question is the the differentiation. Eh? The church has developed this issue of. You know, the difference between the politics with the capital P and the politics with the, the common P. The capital P with political parties where you have specific options and P in general, policy, the, the benefits of the people. And it's not easy to give us a clear yes or no. Um, 
Archbishop um, uh, Camara in, um, in, in Brazil gave a, a very interesting uh, insight into this issue when he said, listen, when I spoke about, when I helped the poor, people called me a saint. When I asked, why are the people poor? They called me a politician and a communist. So can we separate, you know, helping the poor from asking why they're poor? Clearly we can't, um, but now how do you go about helping the poor and what are the structures? And I think in Jamaica, I mean, just to be very, very frank, I mean, there's been a delicate area, for example, where a deacon, very well-known deacon and a friend of us all, you know, was also a, a member of a political party and and and, and, the, and in parliament, you know, and, and in fact, the minister of education. Um, but again, it's, it's not easy to have a yes, no, um, answer to that but I think the question is you know how do you separate the policy the common good from the particular good that individual political parties um, want to address and that's and that's a question for again uh, as Matthew might answer, answer you also have to answer the, the question from the point of view of personal consciousness con conscience and what <laughs> is the, 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 the role that God is asking each one of us to be involved in but I don't think because of that, there should be any excuse for Catholics, especially saying, look, I'm not going to be involved in politics. No, no, no. Hmm? Um, that's another question that should be addressed. Thanks, Mike. Um, Bishop Allen, I see you've unmuted. Did you want to add back or? Oh, just that I didn't remute after I last spoke. So. <laughs> just double checking. Okay, cool. Um, maybe come back to Father Matthew now. Um, uh, Father Matthew, you know, a large part of the challenge that we have been discussing at the level of the commission is how do we move from where we are to where we need to be? And, and, and that's where our actual reflection on, on conscience uh, emerged. I see um, that uh, Diana has made the point in the chat that, uh, yes, we, we do need to submit to God, and, and that's where true dignity comes from, or humanity, and so on, but it's not at all easy. And then Anna raises the challenge of, well, how do we weigh goods, right? There are goods for you, there's good for me, there's good for the community. How do we weigh all of these different uh, ideas or, or sort of beliefs or moral structure systems? And, and I, I wanted to ask you if maybe you could give us a thought, uh, and again, this could uh, be also something that the larger group of participants uh, have ideas on. If we're trying to move from where we are, to where we need to be. What are some of the concrete things that we actually can contemplate based on our experience in the region, based on the experiences from other countries around the world? Uh, how do we, I mean, this is the holy grail of religion, I suppose, right? How do you create genuine conversion and care and love? Um, your, your thoughts, Father Matthew. I think, you know, you said it earlier when you were introducing uh, me, um, one of the things that we need to answer and in a very adequate way is who is the human person? Okay, that, that's, that's, we need to spell out a clear anthropology or an adequate anthropology. Um, and, and because once we, we understand that and the, therefore the relationship with God, the human person um, and, and the dimensions of the human person, and then the, what, what does it mean for us to develop? Um, you know, the human person is called to be an, uh, a person who is a protagonist, for instance, you know, and uh, that I'm not a bystander, but my actions, John Paul II wrote, you know, generate who I become, you know, and, and they reveal who I am, but they generate who I become as well. So that, that anthropology is, is very, very important. And, and then there's the whole understanding. We need to do a lot more understanding in terms of moral education and the development of the good. For instance, with our children, um, and it's, it's also with, with all of us, how, you know, we, we live in a, I was chatting with Sister Julie Peters some months ago, and we were talking about what we're seeing and, and speaking about the lack of identity and belonging that so pervasive within Caribbean culture. And how do we, these things, you know, born into a family, there's a sense of belonging that, that should be there, that's a good, that helps 
the, the child moves to a place of understanding the identity, the, the ownership and responsibility. But if this is not happening, then we have to really break it down. And McIntyre does a good job at this of asking, well, helping the child is sin. What do I, um, what, what's this good for me to do? You know, what, what, how do I distinguish between these goods? How do I choose? And, and therefore we have to do a pedagogy of desire. How do I aim my desires in a way that lead to my flourishing and know that my flourishing is tied into the flourishing of others because I'm made to be gift, a, a gift of self. You know, um, what, what is best for me to do in this beyond my own, you know, selfish wants? What, what, what is it that, that I have to come to here? So, so all those, in other words, how do we develop in the, uh, my country, I would say independent practical reasons, you know? Um, but so th those are some of the things. There, there are many more things there, but within, we, we have to get down at the practical level, what's happening in our families to help grow disciples who are, you know, whole. Mm -hmm. yeah, thanks, Father. So you're also making that connection to other important work in terms of human formation through the family and, and those types of opportunities. Um, Archbishop Pinder, your hand is up. Please take the floor. If you could unmute them. Archbishop, you're muted. Yes, the, I think the, the, someone had the hand up before. Let, let, let the lady go first, and I'll come afterwards. She raised the hand. Nuala? Yes. Sorry, I'm, I'm not seeing another raised hand, um, Archbishop. I think Nuala Manis is from Nuala, you're muted. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hi, Mike. Nice to see you again. Um, we work together. Um, my observation, my listening to all, everything is so great and wonderful that you've, you've put here today. And conscience is the one that really grabbed me. How do we change a conscience? Now, in the Caribbean, I know America is very much in vogue in the Caribbean and their politics and what they see and what they do and all that. I think we lost you, Anna. You lost Nuala, me. Can you hear us? Yeah, we lost you for a bit. Oh, good yeah. Lord. Yeah. Unfortunately, my yes, my it's on again. Okay. Are you hearing me now? Yes, please go ahead. I'm saying that um the church, to cut a long story short, the church should use leaders in the community who are generally labeled by the politicians and so on as the rich people. These are the owners of big business in, in the Caribbean. I know in, in my own territory, right? It happens where all the help is given and all the accent is on the poor people who are struggling. But the, the big business in the Caribbean really employs a lot of the poor, poor people, right? And are left out in the cold. I remember our bishop who is fantastic at, the, at his homilies and how he interacts with people. He, at a funeral, he challenged, it was a businessman, it was my husband, and he challenged people there because they were all, almost every business leader was at that funeral. And he challenged them, Catholics and non-Catholics, to have a conscience, to take care of their people. And it, I know afterwards it created a, a gigantic ripple among those people. The church needs to use the leaders in the community to help because they are in contact. In our company, we, we employ over 500, 600 people. And these have families, you know? We tend to start at schools and all that, but the children are still under the care of their parents. So we have to start with the older people and bring it down into the into the low people. Thanks, thanks, Father. That. That's a really important point. Yeah. Yes. I appreciate that you're bringing us back to the local level and your point about using the leaders in the community. 
as a as a resource you know not trying uh, thank you yeah. mike i see mm -hmm. mike has given a thumbs up as well sorry to cut you know like we got a couple other hands and bearing the time in my archbishop would you like to go now or would you let sharon go yeah i'll just speak very very briefly okay the, um, thank you yes uh, with respect to the question of um, uh, uh, the church's involvement in politics and partisan politics i mean clearly we, we live in a region which is extremely uh, intensely partisan politically. I, and I think that's something we have to be very, very uh, conscious of. At the same time though, the church has to be an ongoing dialogue partner in the formation of public policy for the integral development of our people. That's critically important. But to do so, it has to have a voice that's respected. And the foundation of that respect has to be the church's engagement for the common good in being genuinely involved in education, being genuinely involved in the care of migrants, being genuinely involved in, in the care of the poor. I think that's very, very important. Once it is clear that, that church, the church's involvement in those areas is, is actually genuine and significant and important, I think that it will have that residue of respect so that when it speaks, when the church speaks, it will not be seen as merely partisan. I think that's critically important. Really valuable. Thank you very much, Archbishop. Much appreciated. Sharon, you're coming in from the Archdiocese of Port of Spain. Please take the Port floor. Port of Spain. Yes. Yes. So I'm thinking of the situation that occurred on Monday, where our teachers' union has called on teachers to rest and reflect on the first day of school rather than go to school because they are in the process of negotiation and they are not satisfied with what has been offered to them. But that left some teachers in a bind, and it's a conscience They, you know, so some teachers reached out to ask, what do I do? I have a responsibility to my students. It's the first day of school. It's the first full year, full term after the pandemic that we're coming back into school, you know. What do I do and how do I choose? And I think... You, you know, Nuala talked about reaching to the adults, not just the children. And these adults, these teachers need to know, and there's going to be more because they are in the process of negotiation. So as the term goes on, tutor will call for more action to be taken and so on. And teachers then need some help in making decisions about what do I do? And, and, and it's a good opportunity as well to inform the people of the nation about how you think these things out. Thanks very much, Sharon. Colleagues, we have a couple more minutes left. Uh, that's a good example, actually, Sharon, of, of how the dilemma with conscience and the weighing of public goods uh, plays out in reality, right? And, 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 and it's a classic case. I mean, and, and I guess you could find many, many others, traffic, um, gender, economics, uh, oil and gas in Guyana, you know, all these things. So um, there's no shortage of examples, but that's a really good one and it's very current. And I suppose in there is also possibly some partisan politics. And I don't know about Trinidad so much, but certainly in Guyana, if that were to happen, we would assume that there was some partisan politics also involved, uh, but we wouldn't um, necessarily have to go there right now. Colleagues, we have another couple of minutes before I ask um, Bishop Allen to do the wrap up, but any last pressing points, comments, questions? Could I have a Mark word here? Hi, I, Deacon, please go ahead. Thanks very much. I, I would like Father Matthew Ragbeer to just say a few words on the question of violence. All the territories of the region uh, have very high homicide rates and, and senseless, gruesome violence. How does conscience fit into that? Just, we, we can't leave this discussion without some comment on that. Father Matthew. Sorry, yeah, my uh, thing was muted. I, I think, you know, yes, you're talking about systemic violence, violence present in so many ways and and how how does conscience come into that? See, more, more importantly than conscience, and I said this before, is virtue, because conscience, the, the formation of conscience is, it's conscience is a part of the of, of the virtues, but, you know, virtues are uh, the ways of, how acting excellently, you know, and 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 therefore the the ways of loving each other, um, put in action, and and within there there are questions that would emerge for us: Who am I called to be, and what kind of person do I want to become? 
you know that there's a reality of our own brokenness that that we we often shy away from that we also have to to see that the, the goods at stake you know over the last few months in Trinidad, you have a number of scenarios where somebody breaks up with somebody the, the woman goes with another guy and the, the ex you know he got horns or, or whatever and you have bad tabank as we say here he goes and kills the person and kills both of them and we, we've we've seen that pattern happening in Trinidad you know so you, you're dealing with it's it's more than just conscience it's it's a healing it's a um a, a, what is going on with our men <laughs> the inability of our men to and, and again I'm coming back to the pedagogy of desire that Benedict the 16 speaks about you know because when our desires are many and they go all over the place you know who is what what kind of pedagogy which is a virtue formation how are we journeying with each other to to help understand okay I am rejected but you know, what, what do I do with that now? So there's a lot of accompaniment. You know, the, the, the good that we have to work on is our, the accompaniment. Um, and yes, there the, are the layers to this that need to be unpacked. You know, it's, that's just off my head, you know, but, but there's, there's a lot of work that needs to happen in our society um, at the level of our own desires that, that quite often run amok. And, and I'm not talking repression. I'm talking about carving our desires. And uh, so it's not overindulgent, it's, it's carving them. Thanks, thanks. Thanks, Deacon, for bringing that up. Thanks, for, um, Matthew, for, for responding. Um, it's, violence is definitely featured on the Commission's radar, and, and it's something we recognize as a really big problem. So thank you very much for putting a spotlight on that. We've got a couple more hands to go. Uh, I'll ask uh, Bishop Harvey uh, if he can uh, take the floor now. Oh, sorry, sorry. Hey. Richard. Well, that's okay. Hello. Go ahead. I'm on please. meeting now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I was going to just cap on something here, which I feel is important for us to end on an, on a, a positive note, if I may put it that way. And uh, the presentations have opened up a whole set of areas. But one of the things that I have found very hope inspiring for me is to look at all that we have discussed now from a sense of adventure, the moral adventure and the societal adventure that is the Caribbean today. We are, well, it's not just the Caribbean, in a sense it's the whole world, but we are so overburdened by the violence and so on and so on, that we fail to see that we are in a creative moment. And I say that deliberately because I think no matter what area, we have a tendency, particularly within our Catholic church falling in line with some of the more fundamental churches, fundamentalist churches, to fall back on what we consider to be the basics. This is where we stand, we cannot do otherwise. But when you think of how, you know, Matthew spoke very eloquently about the human person, who am I? Who is this human being? When you think of that, you realize we really are in a, a moment in time on the edge of something that is absolutely phenomenal. And for me, the image that I keep before my mind all the time is the James Webb Telescope. So I really would like the commission, all of us, to look towards this sense of adventure, this spirit that God is calling us, he's doing a new thing. And we don't always see it. The, the book of Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel makes that very clear to us but both in terms of Caribbean society and the ethical demands of that society, I would like to suggest that a key word is adventure. Thank you. Thanks very much, Bishop. It's a really good reminder, Ashley. We can sometimes get carried away with the negativity of the, of the, of the moment um, without remembering that we're on a journey. And actually sometimes there's a lot of really positive things. Much appreciated. I won't try to synopsize that much more. But let's have the last contribution, please, um, from Father Ike. I think he's coming from the uh, Diocese of Paramaribo. Uh, so, Father, you have the, the last word before we, we wrap up. Thank, wrap you. up. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, all the presenters who are, have presented this evening. And it has really been a very interesting topics. And my observation and also contribution goes also to Reverend Father Matthew, 
um, from your presentation, I was meant to understand that uh, the issue of conscience, um, the conscience is not uh, infallible, but goes a process of uh, formation. And I know through my study of uh, anthropology that human person is so complex and also like also the conscious of man too. So my question and also my contribution is to what, which extent can a conscious be formed? And we can say, yeah, this person is really a reformed and a formed conscience. Because when you see, sometimes you see a man that you, everybody will bear with that this person is a very good man, very good man. Everybody just praising him and the rest of them. And all of a sudden, this person disappoints through one action or, or the other. And in the mind of people, you can say that this person is really a good person. He has been trying. What actually and to what extent could a, a conscience be formed? And we can say, yeah, it has gotten to its, um, what do you call it, final stage that this person has made it through God's grace or whatever. Why is it that sometimes a good man disappoints and behaves in a way that everybody will be disappointed and begin to ask, why? What brought this person to this action? Thank you so much. Father Matthew, I don't know if you, yeah. Okay, um, what, what I would say is that, first of all, remember conscience is a, it's like a light, okay? Um, and a well-formed conscience, someone may know very well, this, I, I, this is good for me, this is bad. So we're moving out of right or wrong, you know, this is good, this, this, or, or this is not good. And, and through their own weakness, et cetera, you know, not be able to choose that. And, and it, it is a reminder for all of us, you know, Father uh, Bishop Clyde speaks about the journey, the adventure, that we're all on a journey, you know, and that we, we are made, I, I said this earlier, and, and it, it always has stopped in me the first time I heard it, we are made on the way. So, so the approach we often have is this kind of perfection. You know, Pope Francis ends off Amoris Letitia with, with, with those most beautiful words. You know, all of us, are, are, if I remember, all of us are called to keep striving towards something uh, more beautiful or, or whatever it is. But you know, it, it's, it's words that tell us that, yes, we, we, we are on a journey towards something and the, the final note in that symphony has not been played, you know, and, and therefore we have to just keep going. And, and it brings us to humility. That, that itself is God's gift to us. And, you know, we, we, who are we? You know, this is like Job coming to realize, who am I? You know, so conscience and, and the, the well-formed person is, no way, is in no way perfection. You know, we have to be very careful of that. In the words of Pope Francis, where all of us are called to keep striving towards something greater than ourselves and our families. And every family must feel this constant impulse. Let us make this journey together. Let us keep walking together. And, and therefore, it, it comes back to the fact that the social responsibility, somebody is, it's not that we, we can't learn something from them. Even in the humanity, we're learning something from them. And the way they get up, we're learning something. We see the invitation to walk with them, to pray for them, to be a brother or sister to them. And, and, you know, so I, I think it's an invitation to change uh, the, the frame that we work with that, that quite often is black and white or, or just, you know, it's, it's, it, it doesn't make space for, for human growth and development. Thanks, Father. Um, so we're getting a, quite a few um, requests for the slides, especially yours, Father Matthew. Is that something that you can make available for sharing? Yeah. Is that yeah, okay? Yeah. Great, cool. So uh, we will share the slides using email uh, for those um, uh, who wish to interrogate further and, and certainly get into the richness of the of the of the depth of the presentation. So so thanks, Father Matthew, and, and thanks in advance, Mike. I'm assuming that you don't mind if your slides are also shared. Colleagues, it's now ten minutes to eight. I really don't want to get between people and their hard-earned dinners, but um, you know, I know it's been a great session. It's um, we've had close to six or something participation participants throughout throughout this uh, discussion. Uh, the first of a series of webinars. This one being an introduction. So we never pretended that we we're going to exhaust the entirety of integral human development in one night, uh, much less one webinar. So 
maybe just to, 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 to wrap things up and to point us um, for future webinars, I'll ask Chair of the Integral Human Development Commission for the AC, um, Bishop Allen, if he would be so kind as to also to do a wrap up for us. I see there's a question, but will the recording be shared as well? I'll ask Lauren if she can respond to the question about the recording and its availability, if, if Lauren would mind responding to that in the chat to Gian Parma and others who are interested in knowing. So, uh, Bishop Allen, over to you. Well, first of all, to thank everyone for just uh, taking time to, to gather in this way uh, and around these very uh, pertinent and important topics. Um, and, uh, you know, over the evening there, just to hear things going on in our church, which we ought to be really excited about this, this synod. You know, what we did tonight was part of a tradition of, of the church uh, at all times throughout its history, reflecting and looking at things afresh and trying to articulate, trying to understand. It. So this in itself was, you know, an exercise in keeping with our tradition, just trying to the best we can to, to um, bring that truth before us. Um, very nice too that we have been, this conversation this evening has included so many from the region. Um, and I will certainly sit down with the, the commission now and from, from this um, webinar this evening, you know, to, to look at the steps ahead. And uh, of course, not only this commission, you know, that you know, part of that integral development is that all these commissions would be very much in touch with each other and, and uh, being support and, and adding to what each may have as their particular mandate. So I'm certainly uh, like to sort of go with that word of our Bishop Clyde, you know, that it's an adventure, you know, that we really, you know, look at all this with great um, anticipation, with excitement, you know, with, uh, with a confidence, a confidence, with a faith, you know, that uh, there's so much special of our, of our region and how to bring it to blossom. So thanks again, everyone. And, uh, and this has been a blessing. We ask God then, as we close, to continue to accompany us. We ask you. God in prayer to be with us as we continue our synodal journey. Um, and the many ways in which we just uh, are, are there on the move and as pilgrims, as disciples, seeking that fullness of life and, and the ways in which we bring that to each other. So may God continue to bring this to us, to grant us participation in all of this, that each of our lives will be a light for one another and may his blessings be upon us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks, Bishop. And on that note, uh, wish everyone good and safe night. And thanks very much again for your participation tonight. We look forward to seeing you on the next occasion. We'll let you know when. Thanks, and good night. Many thanks, Lawrence.